RuPaul's Drag Race. That show gets better and better every episode. <laughs> I'm not kidding. But that's the only good show now. Welcome to A Century in Cinema. I'm Arthur. And I'm Andrew. And this is a podcast where we discuss a classic film from every year. Today's film is from 1949. Carol Reed's The Third Man. And you can always find where The Third Man is streaming in our show notes. 1949. Okay, there are a few big developments in the Cold War this year. The Berlin blockade and airlift that began in 48 comes to an end. And after that whole situation, NATO is formally established. Basically, a treaty promising that the U.S. would help defend Western Europe from the Soviet Union. And in China, the nationalist leaders flee to Taiwan. So the leader of the Communist Party, Mao Zedong, establishes the People's Republic of China. So now the Western powers are going to be in this tense Cold War standoff with Communist Russia and Communist China to huge countries. Very importantly, the Soviet Union successfully tests its first atomic bomb this year. America no longer has a monopoly on nuclear weapons, which will lead into the arms race we see in the 1950s. Uh, In popular culture, the first Emmy Awards are presented this year. Color TV is developed. 1984 is published. And I know we've been kind of on a British cinema kick for our last two episodes and this episode too. Um, But it's important to note that in Hollywood right now, the blacklist is going on. HUAC is looking into communist influences in the film industry, and a lot of people are getting their careers utterly ruined in the blacklist. I do want to say Jacques Tati releases his first feature-length film, Jour de Fête. He is about to show how comedy is done visually in film and never be matched. But his career really takes off this year. And The Fast and the Furious comes out this year. Not to be confused with The Fast and the Furious. Fast and Furious is the first animated short starring Wile E. Coyote and The Roadrunner. Oh, cool. Yep. It's all Chuck Jones. And taking a look at the top box office, I don't think I've seen or heard of any of the big movies that came out this year. Samson and Delilah from Cecil B. DeMille. Okay. Nope. Pinky. Pinky. Come to the stable. (laughs) Notably absent, uh, the third man. I don't see the third man anywhere. It was a hit, though. It did well, Arthur. (laughs) At the same time, I still think this is a film that encompasses the films of the 1940s, at least the classics that we've been looking at, and just does it so well. When I think of 1940s filmmaking, I'm going to think of The Third Man. It's got Orson Welles, it's got the film noir feeling, it's got the post-war setting and everything. A lot of deep focus, right? Dark So you like this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Finally, a movie Arthur likes. (laughs) So hard to please. (laughs) (laughs) i was just kidding so you liked this movie i love this movie Um, i see here that you watched a movie called shadowing the third man amazing documentary that's where i got like all of my information for this podcast (laughs) um john hurt narrated it there were interviews with carol reed with alexander corda david oselznik orson welles yeah, it was really, really great. I was enthralled by it. Um, do you want to go over the synopsis of this film? What's going on in The Third Man? The Third Man. It's about our main character, Holly Martins, has come to Vienna to see his friend Harry Lime. However, once he arrives, he discovers that Harry is dead, and he immediately goes to his funeral, where he meets our two other main players, Anna Schmidt and Major Calloway. He gets involved in a conspiracy theory because he's trying to discover the circumstances surrounding Harry's death and starts to find out that everyone involved in his death, including the person who ran him over with a car, the people who carried him away, were all close associates of him that just happened to be around. He then finds out that Harry was involved in a 
penicillin distribution crime where he was watering down penicillin and it was killing children and he was selling them on the black market for large amounts of money. Right when he feels completely defeated by learning this information, he sees Harry alive in the flesh and it all culminates in a big police raid of chasing Harry through the Vienna sewers and Holly is forced to kill his own friend that's what happened. Yeah, there's there's a lot. Major Calloway and Anna play a big role. I guess I didn't talk about Anna at all. Anna was Harry's lover. The film mildly teases that there might be something between them. But then in one of the most iconic shots in cinema history, at the ending, we watch her walk all the way from a street and he, she passes him by without even giving him a second glance. Yeah, it's great. Feels great. I love that ending. Yeah, it, that was really what hooked me my first time watching it, too. I said during The Red Shoes that that's one of the few films that I've given full marks, like a five stars out of five stars on. And this is another one of those. Every time I watch this movie, man, I just feel like I learn a little bit more from it and I, I'm even more entertained by it. Is it just entertaining? Like, what is it about it that really strikes you? I love the fact that it's a... Film noir, but instead of our main character being the hard-boiled guy, the hard-boiled guy is kind of split between Major Calloway and Harry Lyme. They, like, sort of take parts of what your leading man in a film noir would have. Mm -hmm. And then our main character, Holly Martins, is just this complete blank slate for us to sort of live in. And he's just this dumb American who messes everything up. He's never sensitive towards any of the things going on around him. He doesn't care about like external circumstances at all. He's stumbling through this plot. Yeah, and I, I love the fact that the film itself is so dark and goes for this very realistic aesthetic, but then the music is like this comedy jamboree on a zither, and um, it's Tarkovsky who famously said, sound should contrast the image, not complement. And I feel like the third man is like a proof of concept <laughs> of that. I, I love that juxtaposition. It, it gives the film such a unique feeling throughout the whole thing. And especially because they keep playing the same weird tune throughout it. You're going to have that stuck in your head for days. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love this movie. I also, I mean, you know, it has that little theater element in it. It's only one scene, but, you know, he goes to the theater and they're in those big period costumes and he goes backstage. There's just so much to love about this movie. Um, and I like what you said. It is a film noir. It has a lot of the tropes and conventions, but you usually see film noirs set in L.A. or New York. They feel at home there. And this being in Vienna, in Europe, you know, in post-war settings the bombed out streets and everything. Mm. It feels so fresh and unique. I, I don't think I've seen a film noir that feels quite like this one because sometimes they can feel a little conventional, a little cliche. This one feels really new. And this is another film. I, I can't remember what the other one I said this about was, but this is another one where if someone said, if a movie's in black and white, it's boring. I would show them this movie because it's just so entertaining. And it's, I find this movie very funny. I, I like all of, all of the comedy in this movie works ridiculously well. Everything about him being an author. <laughs> and when it starts off, you think, oh, he's like a novelist. Like, you know, it's a film noir. So he's like a pulp novelist and he's going to have this like perspective on things. But instead, the movie's like he's just this trash novelist that no one likes. Like, it's <laughs> bad. He spends book. a lot of the time getting drunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, and the one guy who's like read all of his books is like this bumbling oaf <laughs> police officer who like has very yeah. simple tastes. And then he <laughs> has to speak at this literary conference through this series of complete ridiculous like events and like he speaks at this conference and nobody is impressed by anything he has to say he just completely <laughs> flops um a funny little tidbit originally in the script an effeminate man was supposed to ask how do you feel about oscar wilde but i think it was i think it was selznick's people were like you cannot do that. Like, you cannot imply it that there's this gay character 
at all. So it got changed to the man asking, what is your opinion on James Joyce? Which is just as funny because he has no idea who James Joyce is. (laughs) So this film was based on a novella. So Graham Greene wanted to write a screenplay. And he wrote it into a novella first. He wrote that novella not even to be published or read. He wrote that as a basis for him to write the script off of. Went to Vienna to get inspiration and was there for, I believe, two weeks. And according to him, he was there for the entire time and didn't find any inspiration. While he was really moved by how Vienna looked post-war, he couldn't come up with a plot and nothing Nothing was clicking for him. And it was the day before he was supposed to fly out that he randomly by chance ran into this woman who was talking about the sewers underground. And he got to take a tour through the sewers while he was on the tour. Someone was talking about how they would do watered down medicine, black market peddling in these sewers that that was what he needed and it was and he flew home the next day and wrote the novella in like a couple days and that's his perspective is that he had no idea what it was going to be about he had no idea what to write and then that last day he was in there and over the course of maybe two hours and one conversation he thought oh i've got it (laughs) that is so Um, interesting though he went and got the setting first and and let the setting inspire his story mm -hmm. and that does kind of lead back to what i said how this feels so unique and i do love how tied it is to vienna and its history and uh the situation it's in after world war ii well i think this is a good time to jump into the next point really which is i i I, watching this film within the context of this podcast and thinking of its place in history I thought, oh, my gosh, we have this entire decade of the 40s. It feels like we've sort of been building towards the third man. And I hadn't even really thought about it like that. Yeah, totally unintentional. (laughs) Yeah, but we watched one of the noirs that set the rules for what a noir should be, double indemnity. And then we watched Rome Open City, which is all about capturing the realism of a city. And there's only two main actors in it and everyone else is a real citizen, similar to Third Man, which is filmed in real post-war Vienna. And everybody outside of those four main characters, and I think the guy and his uh, wife from the Literary Council, I think they are actors as well who came in. But everyone else, even the woman who lives with Anna, even the man who is the caretaker in the uh, hotel that Harry was staying in, those were all citizens of Vienna. So, like, that element is there. There's, like, this element of documentary to the movie. Yeah, a little bit. And then we watched these two major British production films with Black Narcissus and The Red Shoes. And that's sort of like a culmination of this, too, because this is a huge production for Britain. And it's also a co-production with America. It's Alexander Korda and David O. Selznick going together to produce this film. And uh, David O. Selznick notoriously independently produced Gone with the Wind and spent the rest of his career trying to top that. At this point in his career, he had already sort of retired. He'd taken, I think, like a four or five year break and he'd said he didn't want to produce another film. But when he heard Carol Reed was involved, Graham Greene was involved and Corda was going to be going in on it, they were looking for a Hollywood production and distribution. He jumped on it. And so it's like kind of all of these legends of the early films Um, Because Alexander Cord is a very famous British producer. London Films is his production studio. And and so it's it's like all these major talents of the time period coming together to make this film. And then the film itself takes place in Vienna, which is divided evenly among the four allies. And so it's got this multiple country perspective within the film itself and from outside of the film. Really interesting stuff. Kind of makes you wish there was like, a fully, like, Russian studio (laughs) involved in it somehow. Alexander Korda is Austrian-Hungarian, so there is that perspective on it. It's just amazing to me how this film, the location of it, reflects the production of it and vice versa. Going back to kind of what I mentioned earlier with the Berlin airlift that's going on, so what's going on in Germany at the time, which is supposed to be divided amongst the Allies is that three of the allies, you know, America, Britain, France, are trying to unify their 
Western side of the country, which is going to create a power imbalance that really angers the Soviet Union. Um, so it actually makes a lot of sense that Russia is not involved in this production. There right. is the schism between <laughs> those allies going on at the time with the blockade and the airlift and everything. Um, and also uh, going along with what you said, this being a culmination of what we've talked about, we never really stop to mention Orson Welles or look at any of his work, but he is a huge monumental figure in the 1940s in Hollywood. Yes. Obviously with Citizen Kane, and he seems to be popping up in a lot of places now. Do you know what's really funny, um, before we get into all the Orson Welles stuff, because there is a lot to talk about with this movie about Orson Welles. Of course there is. There's always a lot to talk about with Orson Welles. <laughs> right. um, but before we get into that, um, the... The actor who I mentioned earlier, who was a citizen of Vienna, the one who was the porter at the hotel, mm -hmm. Paul Horbiger, he he was an actor. He just had only acted in Vienna and was more of a local actor. And it's so funny because there's this story that's told by Carol Reed, Alexander Korda, and uh, David Oselznik have told this story where they were trying to get these locations and trying to find places. And they would tell people... Joseph Cotton is in this film. Alita Valley is in this film. Orson Welles is in this film. Like they, like they would tell them like these names, and no one would know who they were or care at all. And <laughs> they just happened to have Paul Horbiger with them while they were looking out for one of their <laughs> locations, and everyone lost their minds and was like, "It's Paul Horbiger!" And like all, and they started like giving them drinks and food and all of this stuff. And so even though they had this A list talent. Talent. Whenever they needed a location from that point forward, they would tell them that Paul Horbiger was in the film and it worked every single time. And they're like, he literally got us the locations. This movie would not have been what it was if it wasn't for us saying that he was in the movie, which is just so funny to me. One last tidbit about him. I could go on about this forever. He didn't speak a lick of English at all. So he speaks broken English in the film. They gave him the phonetic line once and he would do it in one take and he never messed up. <laughs> when you watch his performance, of course, his character himself speaks broken English, so he's able to get away with it. But it's still so convincing. You like can't tell that he doesn't know what he's saying. So, Andrew, what's the movie actually about? It's a film noir, so it's dark. Like, what's the theme going on here? I think the main theme of this film is survival. The entire movie is about these people who have been put through the ringer and all of them are doing what they need to do to survive. And there's just this huge moral ambiguity with it because it's like Harry Lyme did what he had to do to survive and to make money, but he also killed these children. Uh, so it's like, whoa, okay, <laughs> you know, you know, it, it's it's like, and I don't know if it is more for some people, it won't be morally amb ambiguous at all. Harry Lyme is a villain. I think Harry Lyme's a villain, and and that's fine. <laughs> I I think that he is the villain of this story, but I do think this story is also about how people at this point in time in these countries were doing what they had to do to get by, and there were a lot of innocent victims because of it putting moral judgments on them is your call but at the end of the day they were doing what they had to do to survive i guess i saw it i mean you have him running around in the sewers like a, a animal some, something that is just crawling around trying to get by mm -hmm. i i guess i saw it as yeah the post-war situation and everything being divided up by these different superpowers and no one really having any sense of what government is in charge or who's really supposed to be enforcing justice lets this situation arise where morally compromised people like Harry Lyme can take full advantage. And I thought his conversation with his friend in the Ferris wheel kind of displayed that he just wants to make money and he really doesn't care about the other people who get in his way. He's kind of a happy psychopath. He is taking advantage of the situation without any question and doing horrible things to do that. The uh, I think him getting to that point of being like a profiting racketeer was because he was originally doing it for survival. And now he's completely lost his mind. Okay. 
I guess we just never see it in the film. It's just a backstory, so it's not super apparent. Right. But yeah, I see that. Um, should we talk about Orson Welles? Let's do it. <laughs> Harry Lyme, Orson Welles. What do you have to say about Mr. Wells? So one of my least favorite things about movies today is plot twist. This actor's in the movie. I think about Edward Norton in the uh, Alita Battle Angel. I think about uh, freaking Guy Pierce in Prometheus. Like just that, oh, but you, you didn't even know they were in this movie. And I always think it's like so dumb. And... I love this movie because it's kind of the exact opposite. All of the marketing and everything around the film was telling people Orson Welles was in it and kind of making him out to be the main character. And he doesn't show up until like an hour in. And then he's only in it for maybe 20 minutes total. Yeah. And he immediately runs away in his first scene. Yeah. And I, I, <laughs> I like I like that aspect of this movie a lot. I think that works so much better than doing the opposite of that. It builds a lot of intrigue and kind of makes it into this huge figure yeah the story keeps layering and layering and you're getting so interested and you know the whole time harry lime is alive because orson wells is playing him and that's who i'm here to see so the film is able to sort of play on the fact that you know he's alive i, I really think that of all the plot twists he's in the movie people like orson wells is a great one to choose <laughs> You know he loved that, the fact that everyone's talking about him for the entire movie and he only had to show up on set for, like, two scenes. And, um, yeah, didn't even uh, show up. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about that. I don't even know this story. Oh, my gosh. This is the funniest thing in the world. So being on this tight production schedule, this entire movie was made in seven weeks. And it's Alexander Korda and David O. Selznick, two of the most professional producers in the world, probably of all time. These guys were both huge award winners, very well known for their tight productions at this point. You know, again, one of them independently pulled off Gone with the Wind, which, regardless of your opinion of that film, is just an amazing achievement. So (laughs) they're having to deal with Orson Welles, who's this wild card in Hollywood right now. He had a lot more scenes in the original script. And then he missed his flight and didn't show up to Vienna. That has to delay his entrance until later. And they have to do a bunch of rewrites with Graham Greene. And they figure it out. They're like, okay, we only need him for this week now. So just to be safe, they have him fly out for two weeks and he stays in his hotel room and refuses to leave. He he does not want to be out in Vienna. He does not want to leave his hotel room. He does not want to be he does not want to be involved (laughs) at this point. So this is so freaking funny to me, man. Um, Knowing he had a. a likening towards magic tricks. <laughs> 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 they hired a professional magician <laughs> and told him, if you come to this location, you will, we are going to have a magic show for you. And it was the first time anyone in production had seen him besides casting him <laughs> since the very beginning. And he really did show up for the magic show. Show. Like a five-year-old being egged out of their room with a magic. Quite literally. And then he acted like one even more because they're like, okay, you're here. We're all ready to go. Let's get this crack in. And they get him into the sewers and he is there for less than an hour and says, I cannot stand this place. I cannot stand the noise. I cannot stand the smell. I refuse to come here. And left. <laughs> <laughs> So there's no footage in the film of Orson Welles actually in a Vienna sewer, which, when you revisit this movie, is unbelievable because those sewer sets look so good. Like, 
it's just amazing how there wasn't even really a plan for there to be sets, and then they pulled it together in less than like four weeks. I was also going to say that you could have stunt doubles running in the distance because so many of those sewer scenes and shots are like figures and shadows yes. that are far away, and I love that about it. It's really, really anytime tense. he is, I'm not kidding. Anytime he is running away or it's a shadow, it is not Orson Welles. Of course, it's not <laughs> the most okay. iconic shot of his character when he's standing there at the edge of the sewer and the light comes and we see him from behind, that's an extra with, like, his hair perfectly coiffed to look like Orson Welles from behind. Oh, not an extra, but, like, a stunt double sort of person. Stunt double. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> One of them was someone they literally picked up off the street <laughs> <laughs> for some of the shadow work. Um, and, you know, it's funny to look at, but, man, it does not show in the movie at all no again these are professionals at the peak of their craft veterans of the industry and it shows because you would never know if you're just watching the movie you have no idea that's what's happening that's hilarious i'm looking at that shot where we see orson wells quote unquote from behind looking down the sewer with the light shining on him yeah it looks just like him. Yeah. The hair and the stance and everything. Like they padded his, he was wearing padding underneath his shoulders and underneath his suit so that it would be the same body build. That's amazing. <laughs> Good on them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Super, super impressive work. The only shot of Orson Welles actually in Vienna in this film is when we first see him. It's not even, his, I mean, of course it isn't, but it's not even his shoe that we see the cat licking on during the cat stuff, but just that one shot where it like slowly zooms into his face uh, when he's giving that smirk and then they cut back to it and he looks desperately to the left as the police start coming in. And that's the, that one shot that they cut back to once is the only shot of Orson Welles actually in Vienna and the whole movie. The rest of it. That's incredible. And I can also see the wheels spinning in the producer's heads, uh, you know, make sure that he's in shadow for as long as possible during that scene where we first see him so that we can get a stunt double if we need to. God, as a crew member or producer, that's got to be one of the most frustrating things to work around. But uh, this far away, I think that's hilarious. If Alexander Korda is to be believed, it was never the intention to have all the shadows. The shadow stuff actually was an accident when they were filming another scene. I can't remember what the scene was, but Carol Reed and Robert Krasker, who was the DP, they happened to notice people in the background walking. And he said, look at the way those shadows go up on that wall. So for background stuff from that point forward, they kept having people walk in specific ways so their shadows would cast longer on the walls. And that was all before Orson Welles had even gotten there. It was it was kind of on the fly. They thought, well, we've done all of this work towards figuring out this shadow stuff. It's We're going to turn that into a light motif now. That's like what the movie looks like now. And our third man is just going to be running and it's going to be shadow play. But man, it does not, again, it just doesn't feel like an accident or anything. Like it feels so intentional because this movie looks so intentional. Yeah, it's so impressive. That's a hilarious story about Orson Welles. <laughs> I love Orson Welles stories. They all, they're, you've seen the commercial with him drunk on wine. Right? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I will never forget watching that the first time. I actually, that I was so naive when I first watched that. I felt bad for him. Now I'm just like, Orson Welles, you screwed up so many opportunities along the way. And like, <laughs> we're kind of a jerk to a lot of people. An amazing artist and someone who I really respect for sure, but... I don't feel bad that he had to stoop so low as to advertising cheap wine to fund his projects. <laughs> <laughs> and the commercials, it's just funny. That commercial is just so funny. <laughs> Good old Orson. It's so weird because as we've discussed, Harry Lyme, you know, horrible person, a villain in this film, somehow became sort of like a cultural icon for people in America. Oh, of course he did. Of course he did. Yeah. And so Orson Welles actually did all of these different teleplays where he was Harry Lime. And it was all of these stories that would eventually lead to him ending up in Vienna. 
like extravagant crimes and stuff as if he's some sort of anti-hero, which is just so funny because I see his character as complex. I don't see his character as an anti-hero. But yeah, the the radio plays, you can actually listen to them all on YouTube. There's one on the Third Man DVD and there's a lot more on the Mr. Arkadin DVD, another Criterion set that I own. But yeah, it's it's so weird that this was like such an iconic character for him in sort of a positive sense. Not weird that it was an iconic character. Weird that people celebrated him like he was some sort of hero. Like we're tuning in to listen to his adventures on the radio. I mean, it's the same reason people love the main characters in film noir, right? Is they do whatever they have to do just to make money and succeed. And I think that taps into some psychopathic American ideal. Yeah. Make as much money as possible. And literally, as he says in the Ferris wheel, who cares about the little ants that die in the process? Yeah. Also, another really interesting point about Orson Welles and another, just another reason why he's just kind of a complete jerk. <laughs> it, it's all said in this one interview. There's this interview where he says, for some reason, people thought that I was taking credit from Carol Reed for directing the film. I don't know why people thought that. I'm sure I was just misquoted. Carol Reed was a great director. However, I did write most of the film. <laughs> 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 which is absolutely not true and it's just so funny because you watch that like you it starts off and you're like oh this is nice he's like clearing the air and then he says that and you're like what the heck man like you didn't graham green wrote this like it is so the reason why he said that is because he improved the monologue where he talks about the different countries coming up with Michelangelo, all of these great artists. And while, is it Switzerland, he says? That Switzerland had an era of peace and all they invented was the cuckoo clock. That sounds about right. <laughs> it's an amazing <laughs> monologue. It's honestly one of the best lines in the whole film. Yeah, yeah. They had told him that they felt like the way the script was right there, he just needed a couple more sentences. So the plan was to do a rewrite, but it was the day of shooting they were on a set. And Orson was like, well, I think I, I think I remember something from this Hungarian play that I really liked. So it's not even truly improv. He's like sort of remembering something from a play he saw. But yeah, then he just spouted off that monologue, which is honestly probably the best dialogue in the film. And the, the, there's great dialogue throughout the whole film, but it's just this one monologue that tells you everything you need to know about his character everything you need to know about the world at this point and just where his perspective is. So I get why he's taking credit for writing the whole movie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's such a fan of magic tricks, as we know. He just <laughs> likes fooling people. But yes, he is a jerk. Despite the fact that I could listen to him all day, his voice is just incredible. I love the War of the Worlds uh, radio play that he did. Orson Welles weaves his own narrative, and we all believe him for some reason. Even though he made a whole movie called F for Fake, which is a great movie, and that entire... That, it's two hours of him being like, everything I say is a lie. <laughs> People keep believing me. <laughs> yeah, I love that movie. It, it, it is. I feel like that film, more so than Citizen Kane, sums up his career and how he is as a person. Yeah. Okay, L let's not turn this entire episode into the Orson Welles episode. No. Robert Krasker, Carol Reed. Uh, Krasker. I, I'm sorry. I, is that... Um... Robert Krasker was the DP on this film. Okay. Robert Krasker and Carol Reed. What did you think of this film on a visual standpoint? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. I love the, you know, incredibly wide shots that show off the entire street. Did they wet down the cobblestone? Because it always looks gorgeous. Yeah. Like it's just shining under the moonlight. So that's a very famous technique now to always wet down any sort of pavement or anything when you're going to film on it. And people point to this and Odd Man Out, Carol Reed's film for this one. But in that film, it's raining the whole night. That movie takes place over the course of one night. Mm. And it's raining the whole time. But while he was filming that, he was like, man, when you make these streets wet, it just like looks more like a movie. And then during filming of The Third Man, Robert Krasker hosed down 
uh, a part of the street. And him and Carol Reed looked through it and were like, well, we have to do this for every single shot. <laughs> and yeah, it, it looks gorgeous because of it. And now that's that's a very known technique is to make the street or sidewalk wet before you film on it. <laughs> right. That's so cool. And I love the Dutch angles. I feel like Dutch angles can get overused, um, but I feel like they were used throughout this movie to good effect. When you watch the film, I've watched this film many, many times. When you watch the film with the perspective of when do the Dutch angles come in, it just adds this other layer to the movie. It's always when a new character is introduced. It's always when some sort of revelation is happening. And whenever things go back to comedy or go back to just um, Holly being a dumb dumb, it always straightens right back out. And it's so well planned. I mean, it feels off kilter, especially with the music going on at the same time. And using that off kilter Dutch angle, they're like the same thing. But I do think everything is working together so well and deliberately. It's a good look. Yeah. But that's not even getting into all the sewer stuff, which looks incredible and amazing yes. i'd love the sewer chase until 2020 for uh, i don't know if they still do it you could do a third man tour in vienna where they take you through the sewers and you can like walk through and they'll do little reenactments of scenes in there um <laughs> you can watch some of that in that documentary searching for the third man uh, yeah i i love it there's a reason to go to vienna but yeah, I just love the distant figures, even if, you know, they're using stunt doubles or whatever. The lights shining through the tunnels and seeing a trench coat dashing off. It's all so mysterious and well done. There are certain parts of movie making where you can honestly say once you see it, you can't unsee it. That is just not the case with this movie, because truly, like... I've known since the second time I watched this movie years ago, Orson Welles, it's never Orson Welles on screen, but it just looks so intentional and purposeful and you ne it never looks like it's not Orson Welles. They do such a good job dressing up these stunt doubles that, I don't know, I just fall into it every single time. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the deep focus in the sewers and then the deep focus at the end in the cemetery. Mm hmm. I mean, yeah, we mentioned it before. That's just great filmmaking. Um, I th I love I love a good long final shot that just I don't know a long final shot of someone walking either towards you or away from you. That's just how to sell me on a movie. I'll f I I will say it's a great movie no matter what at the end. Yeah. Graham Greene in the novella had written that she walked past him. He walks up to her, puts his arm in her arm. And they walk off together and decide to start. And it's sort of implied that they would start a new life together. Oh, boo. No. And it was this huge point of contention between him and Carol Reed. It was like the only point of infighting was before they'd even started filming. And it was Carol Reed saying there cannot be a happy ending to this. They cannot get together. And Graham Greene was like, people aren't going to want to watch that. People are going to hate that. Um, and Graham Greene has even said in retrospect, that he was completely wrong. Uh, to even imagine after her walking past him like that for him to, like, go up and grab her arm, it's like, no, that would not be good. Another another parallel with Casablanca as well. I, I mean, I, is it just me or a lot of the films, you can mention Casablanca, a, a, a lot of the films in the 40s sort of have this not tragic ending, but just really bittersweet. Like we're not everything worked out in the end. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, we just I think watched of Black Narcissus. Yeah, we just watched two <laughs> films in a row that three films. You count the third man, like that, all felt like that. Best years of our lives had like a little bow tie at the end. Yeah, that that felt like the all American dream ending. But they deserved it. They'd suffered enough. <laughs> and that's almost the exception that proves the rule. A lot of the other films that we watched from this decade were pretty. Yeah, Robin City, Double Indemnity. Yeah, I'm thinking of it now. I'm like, oh no, none of these have had happy endings. Yeah, that might reflect something. I don't know. Score. Let's talk score. Yeah. So the first production meeting. With David O'Selznick and Alexander Korda. Um, they were at some sort of club. And Anton Karras was playing his zither 
at that club. And Selznick heard it and thought, that would be such a cool instrument to have in a film score. And then as the meeting kept going, Selznick thought, we need to somehow get this guy involved. So <laughs> they did some really like rushed recording of him playing. And it's he wasn't even a professional zither player. He was just a guy who could improv on it. They played it for Carol Reed and he thought, OK, this is going to be Harry's theme. Um, since it has this sort of mischievous, mysterious quality to it. I think it was, I think it was three weeks before the film was supposed to be done that they, they were still using those old recordings and they had planned to bring him in just to record it once they had other music in place. Mm -hmm. And the more, the more music Carol Reed listened to and the more he was trying to figure out what to do, he thought, if we do that for his theme, it has to be the whole film. So he brought Anton Karras into the recording studio and had him watch the movie and just improv play while he was watching the movie. He watched it five times in a row. Anton Karras said it was the worst day of his life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so he but he made him watch it the first time with no music whatsoever. And then he improv played over it four times in a row. It was the third time he did it. Isn't that the third man, the third rec recording? Oh, very good, very good. Um, but it was the third recording that ended up being used, and people became obsessed with it. And it was a number one best-selling record when they released it. Uh, the The third man theme spent 11 weeks at number one on Billboard's bestsellers and stores chart. Hmm. He never, I don't think he ever wrote for another film again. So, yeah, he eventually, with that money, opened a wine tavern. It became a very fashionable tourist attraction, and he hated tourists and tourism, so he closed it and just retired. <laughs> uh, I get his life. That sounds great. Okay, so we don't have a review from any professional film critic this week. Did we? Not, can we just Google Bosley Crowther the Third Man? Did we try that? He does have one. I just want to use this quote because I think it's funny. Yeah, yeah. Use the quote. But we do have a quote from Carol Reed saying that his friend and fellow filmmaker, William Wyler, who directed the best years of our lives that we watched 1946. So William Wyler sent him a gift, a spirit level, one of those little bubble level things and said, Carol, next time you make a picture, just put this on top of the camera, will you? <laughs> just a little jab at him using so many Dutch angles. And I like that. Do you have anything else on the third man that you want to mention? Oh my gosh, I could go on forever. I didn't even talk about Alita Valley. Um, and she's just uh, she's just so sensuous and beautiful in this movie. Um, Major Calloway, I love my favorite aspect of him being the dumb American is how he can't get anyone's names right, <laughs> and everyone keeps correcting him on their names. And yeah, I I, just, I think it's so great. This is a movie I would recommend to anybody. It is so fun. And yeah, this does feel like such a great film to end on for this decade because like we've been talking about throughout, it does feel like it encapsulates so many of the movements and themes, attitudes that we see throughout the decade. You know, there's been a lot of films tied up with the war and post-war sentiments. Yeah, I just feel like this is a, a great summary. And then you have the filmmaking itself. I mean, deep focus and showing off more of the sets and Orson Welles is here. It, it feels like a great one to end on. Um, and that's it. That's the 1940s. Oh my gosh. So this one's tough for me because What's your favorite? I, because I've got, yeah, I've got two of my all time favorites in here. Of the three films I watched for the first time for this decade, which were uh, The Best Years of Our Lives, Double Indemnity, and Les Corbeau, I do think my favorite was Les Corbeau. I loved that movie, man. I really loved Double Indemnity and Best Years of Our Lives. I, I, It's very difficult for me to think of my least favorite film from this decade. But watching Les Corbeau for the first time, I thought, man, this is so impressive. I just was so... I was so in love with that movie when I was watching it. Yeah. And your favorite film might be something like The Red Shoes or Black Narcissus. Like you said, those are just two of your favorite films ever. 
Well, it, and actually the toss-up is between the red shoes and the third man for me, although I love Black Narcissus, oh, okay. but I also love To Be or Not To Be. I love Dance Girl Dance. Yeah, this was just a really, really stunning decade uh, to go through. If I had to pick my all-time favorite film of these 10, I would say The Third Man, just because I, I have a very special connection to this movie. And um, it shows in the um, audio information on my <laughs> screen right now, <laughs> which is just an hour and 20 minutes of me blabbering. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this decade was full of we just picked really good films and all the films were new to me. So except for Dumbo, I guess I guess I've seen Dumbo as a baby. I kind of forgot we watched Dumbo, you know, I was just thinking that, too. It's so funny because that is According to the stats, uh, that is our most popular episode. Like, people love it. And, like, and I loved it. Like, I loved recording it. And I'm really proud of the episode. But as far as which of these films did I glean the least from, I would say Dumbo. Maybe it's because I've just seen it a million times. I used to watch it all the time when I was a kid. I loved recording that podcast. I liked recording about the Disney company at that era. It was still really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But as far as watch, as far as sitting there and watching the film and being engaged with it, I would say Dumbo was probably my least favorite. But man, I still had a great time watching it. And it's only 64 minutes or whatever. So it right? wasn't like <laughs> it wasn't a huge inconvenience or anything. And it's still a great movie. So, yeah, I don't know. This one's tougher. I, th- I think I feel the same way about like my least favorite. And that feels wrong to say of this batch, which was to be or not to be. I yeah. still laughed and I still really liked it, especially uh, once they're switching roles and everything in the second half of the film. It's still really good, but I'd say that might be my least favorite. And I'd say my and I'd say my favorite was Rome Open City. Mm. I really liked that movie. And it yeah. is the hardest one to watch of all of these. Like it's it's not the most entertaining by any means it's really hard to get through but it just feels like that's the movie that felt the most important i really like researching it i really like talking about it with you Mm -hmm. and i don't know it just that was the film that gave me the most emotional impact it felt really important yeah i said this in the episode itself and it feels silly saying something like this when we are so deep into doing this project together That was just like a big moment for me watching that and thinking, man, contextualizing these movies within the time period of watching them and like pretending we're in this time vortex watching these movies like as if we are living through those years for every movie. Yeah, Yeah, that one, it it just gave me a whole different perspective on that movie, which was one I already loved. Yeah, I, I, I think that one was great. Black Narcissus is so good. Dance Girl Dance is so good. (laughs) <laughs> I think just... Black Narcissus might be the most entertaining one. I, I I don't know. I really like Double Indemnity and I really like The Third Man. Dance Girl Dance is great too. Like there's just a lot of good films and yeah. we are getting into that period in cinema now where there's just more people making movies. There's more studio stuff coming out and uh, there's more notable filmmakers every year that we kind of have to miss out on. It, it does make me sad because Every year that goes by, there's like, oh, I, I wish we had picked that one, but I wouldn't have, you know, thrown out this other one we did. Right. There's just more films. Well, we're going to we're going to keep doing this until we're dead. So we're going to just start over and do different movies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's more color films coming out. We only, you know, touched on two of them. Three of them, if you count Dumbo. Ah, oh, Dumbo, you're right, you're right. See, even, <laughs> even we just we just talked about it. I already forgot that it was part of our lineup. <laughs> we didn't mention it, but I think in 48 or 47, I think it's 48, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States declares that the big studios can't own their theaters anymore. So going forward, that becomes a big issue for the studio system. They don't have that vertical monopoly that they used to have. And I think that changes the film industry going forward. Um, But yeah, that's something that happened that we missed. Yeah. Yeah, this this is a very interesting decade. I mean, going through World War II right in the middle of all of it was just really cool to get to go over through that part of history. I mean, just looking at the films made post-World War II versus at the ones we watch pre-World War II, 
you can feel this sort of shift of energy in how art is made and perceived. I, that was another reason why I thought Rome Open City was just perfect for that year, because that was that was a big indicator of that shift. Like things are not the same anymore. And yeah, to to witness that perspective through art was really valuable to me. I enjoyed it quite a bit. You just mean like things are darker. Things are more bittersweet. Not even. I mean, I, I would say darker is a part of it, but just things are more aware, you know, Black Narcissus is a criticism of Britain's imperialization of India. The Red Shoes is about what happens when you become too obsessed with your art form. The Third Man is about racketeering in Vienna. You know, things just, things are able to be more realistic and are talking about things from a way more realistic perspective compared with Double Indemnity. Film is okay confronting world problems. Yes. And personal issues in a way that's less poetic or metaphorical and certainly less escapist like we were seeing before. Yeah. And I just think comparing that with say double indemnity, which was made, you know, during the war and was in production right before it, where that film was considered so controversial just because it showed two people planning on how to murder somebody. And, and yeah, you know, Dumbo ended on full propaganda (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Dumbo. And then uh, the, the best years of our lives is sort of a reflection on the consequences of the propaganda, you know? Yeah, much more so than I expected. Yeah. So, yeah, just just really interesting stuff. What are we watching next week? Next week, we are watching Jean Cocteau's Orpheus. I love this movie. That's all I'm going to say. No teaser this time. <laughs> And we will officially have a lost episode. Yeah, maybe one day, maybe one day we'll release just the raw audio. If it, if the podcast takes off and people start clamoring for it, yeah, if people just need more century and cinema. Yeah, in their if, lives. They're, if they're not getting enough. <laughs> then, uh... All right, next week, Jean Cocteau, Orpheus. I just want to give a shout out to all our Patreon members who keep the show running. Thank you all. You too can become a patron and get access to bonus episodes linked down in the show notes. You're listening on YouTube now, so like and subscribe and comment down below. Tell us if you've seen the film. What did you think of it? Did we miss anything? Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you for the next one.